for the audience, just a few minutes as we bring the participants to bear. I would ask the secretariat to put the participants. Good afternoon. Just I would like to just do a quick sound check if everybody can uh, can hear me. Just another. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you joining us from countries in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, and uh, and colleagues and participants from the western uh, from the western hemisphere. I'm Pedro de Vasconcelos. I'm the manager of the financing facility for remittances at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Today, I will be your host in the launch of this virtual global forum on remittances, investment, and development or in short, as we say, EGFRID. So as usual practice, I would like to remind participants that uh, this meeting will be recorded for later viewing by the GFRID audience. As per agenda, we will also have two sessions today, which will be followed by a session on questions and answer. Before introducing our distinguished guests, I would like to say a few words on the GFRID process, since some of you might not be acquainted with its nature, its objectives and, uh, and goals. Uh, the GFRID Summit has been organized every two years since its inception in 2005. Uh, and as of today, it is now cover all main regions of the world and gather over 500 participants each time. As many of you know, uh, this year's summit had to be postponed due to the crisis. We are organizing a series, therefore, of virtual events that will lead the way till next uh, year's summit on the occasion of the International Day of Family Remittances on June 16th uh, next year. So this new EGFRID dialogue to implementation kind of a point in time where 1 billion people that either send or receive remittances have remained affected by the socioeconomic impact of the worst pandemic in modern history. From its immediate negative impact, the effects of this crisis are expected to continue well beyond 2021. And for that reason, it is really necessary to take immediate action to ensure that its effects are mitigated and to ensure tomorrow's stability. 10 months ago, the international community was, uh, was taken by surprise to, uh, to try to grasp the ramification of this crisis on remittances. Through dialogue and consultation, the most renowned experts came together uh, to find and inspire solutions in support of remittance families. And now, equipped with some answers and a better understanding on the ramifications of the impact of this crisis, it is of crucial uh, importance to move from dialogue to effective action and implementation of identified measures. And this is, the, in fact, the contribution that the EGFRID and all its partners that compose it uh, have set themselves to, to achieve. So to start this process today uh, event, we will bring forward some of the moving parts in the current global agenda and some of its constituencies, such as the G20 and the United Nations Financing for the for Development uh, process. The second part of the event will be dedicated to addressing specific measures uh, and the pathways towards their implementation. The, this first GFRID will be followed in the coming months by a series of dedicated sessions that will allow us to dig deeper and more precisely into implementation methodologies. And this will allow us, allow us to collect additional examples of what we call observed practice in order to better support all stakeholders from the public and the private sector in addressing the, the, the key challenges and opportunities. And of course, this will be done all to the benefit of the million of remittance families, particularly in the developing world. So without further ado, uh, I would like to kickstart this, uh, this first meeting and welcome you all. You, you see on the screens the, your upcoming uh, speaker. So if we can turn on the, uh, the, the, the cameras, um, I will ask the, kindly the secretariat to, there you go, our distinguished guest. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Maike van Gineken. She, Maike is an IFAD Associate Vice President for the Strategy and Knowledge Department of IFAD. And so at this time, I will invite her to, to deliver her remarks and officially initiate this dialogue to implementation process. So Maike, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Pedro. And also on behalf of IFAD, welcome to this session. A uh, very interesting session and discussion on a very important topic. Globally, over 200 million migrants support over 800 million family mem members through remittances sent back home. These flows are family aid, and they're three times bigger than global official development assistance, and they exceed foreign direct investment in almost all low and middle income countries. The size of remittances dwarfs other financial flows, and it's very apt that we're talking about it today. In 2019, total international remittances reached a record of 548 billion US dollars, and half of those resources were sent to rural communities in low and middle income countries. And then came COVID. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to slam into countries with the impact of a natural disaster. But unlike most natural disasters, COVID affects the entire world at once. COVID is a public health emergency, and that's how we normally think about it. But it's also an economic emergency. And the social economic fallout will certainly outlive the pandemic in length, in duration, and might put development back by 15 years. If you look at estimates on the number of people falling back into extreme poverty, they range from 100 million people to even half a billion people. And the slide in remittances flow is one of the reasons that decades of progress towards the sustainable development goals are lost. The World Bank, and we have a representative of the World Bank here, so he will uh, probably give some more details of this. The World Bank estimates that remittances have declined by over 7% since March 2020. And this puts a lifeline at risk. Indeed, most migrants have less money to send to families, and many of them are out of work and have no money to send back to their family or have been forced to return home. Tens of millions of jobs are being lost, and some permanently, and migrant workers suffer from some of the most direct impacts of the crisis. Their employment level and their wages have plummeted. You've seen some of the really dramatic pictures of migrants going home or being stranded in the countries where they're now unemployed on the television. They lack access to unemployment benefits, and many are unable to send money home to support their families. For millions of families, these flows are nothing less than a lifeline. They support basic needs, they put food on the table, they pay bills, and they build human capital and economic opportunities by sending children to school, by supporting small businesses, and by starting other productive enterprises. Remittances, are family aid and they, they enable millions of families to reach their own sustainable development goal. For those migrants who still have incomes, many of the channels used to send and receive remittances home have been curtailed. This also has impacted the life of many rural families who are digitally and financially excluded, who don't have access or lower access to mobile money, to savings, to credit, and to insurance products. As IFAD, we care about rural populations and about agriculture, and the decline in remittances has been a, a very big blow to agriculture and other enterprises, because remittances underwrite seeds and inputs uh, for farmers. And the decline in purchasing power of remittance families is hurting local communities and economies because there's less demand for food and agri other agricultural um, products. So in March 2020, we were happy with others to launch the Remittances Community Task Force in response to the UN Secretary General's call for global solidarity on the coronavirus. The Remittances Community Task Force has identified actionable short, medium, and long-term solution to the current challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. These measures are summarized in a blueprint for action for the remittances markets in time of crisis and have been included in the process on financing for development. We're very excited today to launch this blue, final blueprint for action. 
The report showcases key challenges impeding progress towards cheaper, faster and safer access to remittances. But it doesn't stop at challenges. Importantly, it also proposes a way forward. The corona crisis underscores the urgent need to develop digital payment systems for remittances. Such digital payment systems expand financial inclusion and entrepreneurship among vulnerable populations, and this will benefit youth and women in the countries of origin first. It also expands access to digital and financial marketers for remittance families. I think another thing that the COVID-19 crisis had underscored is the vital importance of partnership, as urged in Sustainable Development Goal number 17. Nobody can do this alone. We need to bring together governments, the private sector and civil society to address the pressing development challenges of our time. For IFAD, it has been a privilege to work alongside leading institutions and practitioners in the field of remittances. We strongly believe that it's time that remittances uh, are put on the agenda because they have a huge potential to make rural migrant families more resilient. We need to ensure that senders and recipients of remittances can respond, recover and be resilient in the times ahead. Greater access to remittances and financial literacy will give rural families more options and resources to invest in their small businesses and farms. This will improve food security, create decent jobs, especially for the youth, and increase incomes. And all of this will get people out of extreme poverty. It's beyond time to move from dialogue to implementation. And here I want to recall the UN goals and principles of safer, cheaper and faster remittances. At IFAD, we support a more efficient and a more competitive market. We urge expanded digitalization in the sending and the receiving of remittances. And we strongly support greater access to basic financial products such as savings, credit and insurance for rural remittances families. We've already started addressing one of the key impediments in the remittances ecosystem. In collaboration with partners, including the European Union, the World Bank and think tanks, we're tackling the remittances data gap to better support remittances service providers. In doing this, we're particularly focusing on African countries. And we're also launching a country-specific call for proposals for innovative private sector solution and business model in remittances. At IFAD, we're committed to doing our part to ensure that the hard-earned money of migrants creates greater resilience and a brighter future for rural communities and for developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Maike, for your for your remarks. It's uh, much appreciated. Uh, it is now my my pleasure to introduce our two next uh, speakers, uh, Anna, Anna Zanensova and Magda Bianco, for a short uh, presentation. Um, Anna and, and Magda are both uh, representative at the GPFI of the G20 uh, process and, and the reason for this, this joint presentation. Anna is a senior advisor at the Ministry of Finance of the Russian Federation and co-chair of the G20 Global Partnership of Financial Inclusion, or GPFI. And Magda Bianco is head of consumer protection and financial education department of the Bank of Italy. I would like to mention as well that, uh, that Italy will preside over the G20 in the, in the coming year. Anna Magda, you, you have the floor. Okay, I, I will say a few words and then uh, um, <clears throat> and then pass the, 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 the floor to Anna. Uh, well, first of all, let me congratulate uh, the, the Remittance Community Task Force for this amazing work that has been done um, in such a short time, so timely uh, and, and so um, and so important. Uh, and, and also this uh, EG every initiative. Uh, I think that's really important, really amazing. And um, well, we know, we, we know and we just heard how important remittances are 
uh, as a critical source of financing in many emerging and developing countries. Um, so what, what are we going to do uh, with the Italian G20 presidency next year? Uh, well, in the, in, the, in the area of the GPFI work uh, and following basically uh, what is provided for in the financial inclusion action plan for next year by the GPFI, um, the Italian agenda uh, will address uh, the gaps in financial inclusion um, that have emerged uh, uh, during the COVID time, especially for vulnerable groups and hence uh, migrants uh, and other underserved uh, um, people. And uh, we will propose uh, to identify best practices uh, for digital financial inclusion, building on two areas, two among the preconditions to ensure digital financial inclusions, uh, which are on the one hand, uh, uh, increasing how to increase digital financial awareness and literacy for both individuals and micro and small firms. And on the other hand, um, ensuring a more inclusive regulation and supervision uh, to steer somehow digital financial innovation towards a more inclusive financial system, Leverage, leveraging digitalization also for innovative supervisory tools uh, to make customer protection, consumer protection more effective. Uh, we, uh, we think that these are uh, important building blocks uh, to foster financial inclusion and protection also for migrant workers. Uh, and we heard about the importance of financial literacy for them as well, uh, which co could contribute to greater resilience uh, of these groups, uh, um, also to income shocks, which we hope uh, will not occur again, but uh, um, they are uh, something we have to create shield against. Uh, but there is a second line I would like to mention, uh, which, uh, which would be a line of action under the Italian presidency, even if not, uh, not directly within the GPFI work, uh, which is uh, um, continuing to support and engage uh, um, the SSB's work, uh, which has initiated under the uh, Saudi Arabia presidency on uh, cross-border payments. Uh, this uh, um, a roadmap has been defined by the SSBs. Uh, it, it's an important area of work, uh, which hopefully uh, will ensure that uh, there is a, a momentum uh, and uh, specifically on remittances, which will allow to, jo to, to reach a, a, a joint public and private sector vision uh, to enhance cross-border payments, also um, um, favoring, ensuring uh, that remittances flow at uh, lower cost, uh, in a safe way, in a speedier and, and uh, smoother way. Um, so th these are, these are the, the two main uh, um, areas uh, where the Italian presidency will be committed. Uh, but of course, uh, there are there is another at least another area where we will be committed uh, more as uh, GPFI co-chairs uh, together with Anna, and uh, she will tell you about this. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Anna, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Magda, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, my best regards from snow in Moscow. And I am very grateful to IFAD for uh, inviting us uh, to discuss uh, such important and urgent topic uh, in uh, uh, such great event. So thanks a lot for that. And of course, I am also grateful, um, as Magda said already, for the work which was done and uh, uh, in such uh, you know speed and uh, quality. Uh, to for preparing a blueprint for action to set up the menu of options for governments on these issues and all other work which uh, was done by IFA, the remittance community task force. Uh, this is uh, very much in line with 
our agenda with G20 agenda, and I will tell about it more. But I would like to start from a uh, few words uh, uh, to remind all of us that uh, remittances is a long term commitment of G20. It's not just, it's not new agenda, of course, for all of us. And in 2011, uh, G20 recognized the value of remittances flows in helping to drive strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth. So that time, G20 leaders committed to work to reduce the global average uh, cost of transferring um, remittances from 10 to 5%. Uh, in 2014, uh, G20 leaders recommitted uh, to these goals and endorsed special G20 plan to facilitate remittances flow, which include, among other uh, activities, support for the country-led actions to address the cost and improve uh, availability of remittances services, particularly for low-income people. And of course, go beyond uh, and use remittances flow to drive financial inclusion and development for savings, uh, savings for uh, microinsurance, for other formal financial services and products. And um, G20 leaders agreed that uh, the, it will be developed uh, by uh, all G20 countries a national remittances plan. Uh, plans and GP5 would uh, facilitate uh, its preparation and then its monitoring. So we continue to, to do this work. So we uh, update uh, about results every year and we uh, every two years uh, we update the plans themselves. So next year we will do it uh, uh, um, as well as uh, uh, some other uh, work uh, uh, which I'll tell you more. Uh, but uh, a lot of progress has been achieved for these uh, uh, nine, ten years. But however, as we all know, despite uh, some reduction in remittances transfer costs in the past years, the global average cost of sending remittances remained high, and it's even before this pandemic. This had a large impact on uh, receiving families, as each percentage point in transaction cost deprives them of more than US $5 billion dollars per year. And of course, this year, as we already say a lot, uh, um, 2020 has changed the world. Uh, colleagues already said, and I think uh, it will be more said um, uh, during this discussion, that in some parts of the world, the pandemic is fast turning into a humanitarian crisis. In many countries, it restricts business activities and limit access to face-to-face -face financial services. And of course, it's disproportionately impact low income and in developing countries. Um, and uh, migrants, 10 of uh, millions of jobs have been lost, some of this permanently. And as was said, migrant workers are among the most directly affected by this crisis. crisis. So uh, we need to do, uh, we, we already had uh, done a lot, but we need to continue, we need to commit, and we need to do even more. That's why, of course, uh, GP5 uh, confirmed uh, our commitment to uh, remittances to uh, decrease uh, the cost of remittances and uh, other uh, our actions in UFIAP, which we developed this year. So this year we uh, done uh, two main uh, measures uh, relating to uh, remittances. Uh, first, we uh, agreed and uh, again confirmed uh, our um, commitment uh, to G20 action plan, the overall action plan to um, recover and uh, to, to work on um, uh, recovery from the pandemic. And uh, second, uh, what we've done, we developed a three-year, new three-year G20 financial inclusion action plan. And one of the two key digital financial inclusion areas in UFIAP is related to the remittances. Uh, let me quote, uh, promotes the development of responsible innovative payment systems that provide affordable, secure, interoperable, trans transparent, and inclusive payment solutions across borders and within G20 and non-G20 countries to support progress on reducing the cost of remittances while maintaining consumer protection and disclosure. So in 2021, under the, uh, the FIAP, implementation of the FIAP, as Magda already mentioned, we plan uh, to prepare the report on the progress of national remittances plans against the commitments which uh, were uh, previously um, 
included in the G20 plan of facilitate remittances flows in 2014 year. Uh, but of course, uh, our main focus will be to analyze the impact of pandemic on both uh, financial inclusion and uh, transfer of remittances, remittances cost, and how remittances influence on uh, the financial resilience and uh, financial inclusion for uh, specifically low income and underserved and uh, vulnerable uh, groups. Now, of course, uh, among these groups are women, as uh, uh, many of them work in informal economy, many of them uh, would lose the job uh, during this uh, pandemic, uh, young people, uh, rural um, population. So I think that we have a, a very, uh, a very much synergy in our goals and our objectives and our actions with our EFAD and with uh, remittances community. I would like to give just uh, one case that, of course, we will uh, also um, keep uh, and collect uh, the uh, information from different G20 countries, what we've done uh, recently, what we've done, uh, not only in um, uh, lowering the remittances cost, but uh, any other initiatives which help to for financial resilience of migrants and their families. families. For example, um, uh, regional case from uh, my region, uh, we, uh, Russia, Russian Federation, Russian Ministry of Finance together with uh, OECD launched such initiative to first of all to collect data on uh, financial literacy of migrants and their families and also information on gaps, policy gaps uh, and uh, regulation gaps and all other gaps relating remittances and uh, initiate pilot projects uh, in order to improve financial literacy, not only uh, migrants who work in uh, Russia, because it's four countries uh, uh, which uh, citizens uh, work uh, mainly in Russia, and Russia is the biggest sending uh, country for those people, for those countries, but also uh, families who stay at home in their native countries and who not always uh, use uh, these remittances for savings, for insurance. So. It's uh, very important in such situations as pandemic that uh, such families would have uh, their savings, that they, they would have this financial caution to uh, help them to survive and to go through this uh, challenging time. But of course, many countries do different type of initiatives and we will collect this information and uh, we will uh, analyze uh, the situation and provide uh, uh, also different uh, options of uh, uh, measures aimed at promoting digital payment services, uh, first of all, and spe specific attention will be devoted uh, to the opportunities offered by economies of scale and innovation in financial technology, where such uh, innovation aligns with globally recognized standards. For example, policy level standards set by SSBs and technology level standards set by relevant bodies. I believe that this work need to be strongly coordinated with the work of the remittances community task force uh, with uh, IFAD, with SSBs, and we can leverage it. We can uh, do even uh, better all together. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the work which already was done, uh, this uh, uh, blueprint, it can be, uh, it can become some kind of base for our uh, our analysis and. Uh, for promoting uh, these um, initiatives, these actions uh, within G20, and uh, of course, uh, leveraging our position in G20 for promoting it uh, in other countries, not only in G20 level. So I believe that uh, we, uh, though we've done a lot, there is now strong momentum that uh, we need to use. Uh, it's from one side uh, very critical and uh, a lot of challenges and risk, but from the other side, there are uh, opportunities to join our efforts uh, and um, especially in developing uh, digital payment system, safe, uh, uh, transparent, uh, uh, not costly, affordable for uh, our um, population, and that we can do it together. So thank you very much, and uh, I would be glad to discuss this. Uh. Thank you so much, Anna, for and, uh, and Magda as well for for your intervention and for sharing some of the of the views and priorities uh, of this presidency. 
uh, this coming presidency and G GPA five for 2021. And Anna, thank you as well for, for bringing that perspective of remittances on the complementary angles. For many years, it was just a question of cost. I think the, the message from the GPFI is crucial as to understand what we often call the real development impact that remittances have in bridging the gap of financial inclusion by linking this with financial services, insurance, as you mentioned. So thank you so much for this. And, and of course, I can speak on behalf of the entire remittance community task force, 40 members as of today, uh, the idea since the beginning was to consolidate the best views available to bring it to the processes such as the GPFI. And, uh, and that leads me in a nice transition now to our colleague um, that I would like to invite, uh, Jörg Weber, uh, to deliver his remark in this panel. Uh, Jörg is, uh, is head of the investment policy branch in the Division of in, uh, Investment and Enterprise of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, ANCTA. Uh, UNCTAD has played a key role in the, in the recent UN process on financing for development in the era of COVID-19 uh, and beyond, which was launched, if you all remember, on May 28th this year by the United Nations Secretary General, but the Prime, as well as the Prime Minister of Canada and the Prime Minister of Jamaica. As chair of the specific dialogues involving remittances, uh, I would like to invite him to, to share with us some updates and findings in, in this process. So, Jörg, uh, thank you for being with us, and I will invite you to, to take the floor. Yeah, thank you, Pedro. That's uh, very kind of you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting Ante to participate in this meeting. Very honored to be part of this distinguished panel. In your opening words, you already took away my opening remarks, which is basically <laughs> Let you know that uh, I'm here to present you a brief update on what's happened in this uh, process called uh, Financing for Development in the area of COVID-19 and beyond. It started in May 28, uh, 2020, so uh, some seven months ago, the Prime Ministers of Canada and Jamaica and the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Guterres, they uh, convened a high-level uh, event, a summit, so to speak, to join forces with other heads of states and government, international organizations, and other key partners to enable discussions to find concrete financing solutions to the COVID-19 health and development emergency as it unfolded before our eyes. In the follow-up, uh, they created six discussion groups. These were convened to address in discussion group one, uh, questions of external finance, remittances, jobs, and inclusive growth. In discussion group two, uh, questions related to recovering better for sustainability. In discussion group three, global liquidity and financial stability issues. In discussion group four, debt vulnerability. In discussion group five, private sector creditor uh, engagement. And in discussion group six, illicit financial flows. All issues quite important with regards to how one deals with the health and the emerging development economic crisis that we are currently dealing with. ANCTAD was tasked with facilitating the work of discussion group one, the one on external finance, remittances, jobs, and uh, inclusive growth, uh, the, which were co-led. Uh, these discussion groups were led by member states in New York. Discussion group one uh, was honored to be led by uh, Bangladesh, Egypt, Japan, and Spain, and under the leadership of those four countries and their permanent representatives in New York, but also ministerial level officials in capitals. We uh, uh, worked together with collaborating uh, agencies to develop a menu of policy options. And these collaborating partner agencies included EFAP for the questions uh, of uh, remittances, uh, the ILO, of course, for the questions of jobs and uh, inclusive growth, and the OCD for our work on the official development assistance. The group, this discussion group, had three open meetings that each attracted roughly 120 uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, representatives of missions at the ambassadorial level in New York, but also from other international organizations, civil society around the world, attracted these uh, interventions, which helped us sort of fine tune and develop further the menu of options, uh, detailed comments, as well as uh, we had an expert group meeting involving leading academic specialists from the world to develop uh, our menu of policy options. So that's what we uh, concluded with, namely a quite ambitious set, a very thick booklet of menu of on policy options, addressing policies for the short, for the medium, and for the long term, supported by a set of uh, six executive summaries, 
uh, that contained key highlights for each of the discussion groups. These executive summaries were discussed by ministers of finance in a high level meeting on the, 9th, uh, of, of the 8th of September to fine tune and uh, distill further options for the uh, heads of state meeting, which the second heads of state meeting, which was convened on the 29th of September and which got together more than 60 heads of states and government to discuss and voice their opinions on the menu of policy options and indeed to endorse uh, it as we had developed it. The highlight policy options, the executive summary, and the big 400 page full menu of policy options. All of these, of course, are not negotiated documents, but rather a compilation that reflects a wide array of perspectives and priorities. All of these also include now the detailed policy options developed by IFA together with the uh, remittance community task force uh, for remittances ranging from immediate relief measures to remittances family measures and to measures for more competitive and resilient remittances markets and the enabling environment. As I said, IFA took the lead in this matter together with the SPR heading basically the remittances task, community task force, but also taking into account uh, uh, comments and inputs received from other collaborating agencies, among others the IOM, but also Switzerland and the United Kingdom gave, gave valuable comments and Pedro put it all together. Now, in the follow-up to the heads of state meeting, the executive office of the secretary general and the office of the special envoy on the financing for the 2030 agenda for sustainable development have asked the United Nations development system and the international collaborating agencies, namely also EFAT, to take this work, which is now vested with solid political momentum at the highest level to take this work further. And this should include from the perspective of the Secretary General of the United Nations, guiding and optimizing continued technical and policy advisory support and discussion at the global, regional and country levels. In other words, exactly what you are about to bark to do and exactly what you will do now in this meeting as well as in the follow-up meetings is translating this policy menu of options into real life policy tools that can indeed move the envelope reduce remittances costs, make remittances recover from the pandemic and work for development, in particular the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. Allow me as UNCTAD, the organization of course I work for, to express uh, our gratitude. Also, I think on behalf of the Special Envoy to IFAD for the competent collaboration in this work. We are looking forward, the UN is looking forward, to the continued leadership of IFAD and the pursuit of the work of remittances in the era of COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg, for, uh, for, your, uh, for your kind words uh, as well. We've been delighted to, 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 to speak on behalf of the Remittances Community Task Force, uh, as you know, uh, backed by 40 organizations. So having the word of all the stakeholders uh, brought into this this process uh, of the UN, uh, I think, has been uh, an, an engaging uh, an engaging e experience, and and we hope surely uh, to be able to continue to to do this. Uh, we are come to the end of this uh, first session, a little bit behind the uh, time. Uh, we didn't have a questions and answers uh, session planned right now, uh, unless uh, we could, uh, unless somebody wants to to, to post uh, something uh, right now. But if uh, if not, then uh, I will take this opportunity to to introduce the our next panelist uh, and therefore move to the to the next panel on remittances in time of crisis, response, recovery, resilience, blueprint to action. So in so I will excuse my my, my fellow speakers. Uh, uh, Mike, Anna, Magda, and York, thank you so much for, for being part of that. You're not being downgraded, it's just an au revoir, <laughs> but we will, we will upgrade now our colleagues from session two uh, as we go in, in order to start this, this session. Thank you so much again for, for, uh, for being part of this. Um, so while we, while we bring the, the new colleagues uh, on, uh, on, on stage, uh, for this panel, I have the the, the 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 pleasure, basically, to invite three three panelists in addition to myself. 
uh, to introduce and to present the, the findings of this, uh, of this blueprint report. As RCTF members, uh, the Remittance Community Task Force uh, acronym, uh, they're also the co-leads of the different work streams that were created to deliver this blueprint and incorporate the views again of 40 members of this, uh, this task force. This is why uh, uh, we are on stage. We, the, the fact that this is not a gender balance uh, uh, panel is just a coincidence. We apologize for that. <laughs> uh, it happens so that the colleagues of the institutions, uh, but I'm, I, I want to reassure that uh, this will change in the subsequent panels that are already uh, that I've already planned. So allow me to introduce, uh, without further ado, Arish Natarajan. Uh, Arish is the lead financial sector specialist on payments and market infrastructure in the finance competitiveness and innovation global practice of the World Bank Group. Um, we also have Leon Isaac, who is the Joint Executive Development Markets uh, Associate, or DMA. Um, Leon is a recognized global authority in the remittances and money transfer industry, as well as a seasoned uh, expert and, and business leader. And finally, uh, we also have Barry Cooper, who is a technical director at the Center for Financial Regulation and Inclusion, or SEMFRI, uh, where he leads the payments and financial integrity work, uh, work streams. As co-leads of the thematic aspects related to remittance families, I will take the opportunity to introduce the recently released measures related to remittance uh, families. So, however, prior to starting addressing this, uh, I would like is to brief you all on the nature of, of this report. You already heard some, uh, uh, some of its uh, ramification, uh, but I wanted to dig and, and, and present a little bit more on, uh, on, uh, on its objectives. Uh, this blueprint for action addresses the challenges faced by the migrants who send remittances and their family members who receive them back home. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you have not downloaded the the, the report, I will definitely ask you to, to do so. Uh, that's, this has been a collaborative effort among all members of the RCTF. Uh, it includes now, now 19 crisis response measures that we hope will, uh, will, imp will, imp will help improve the regulatory scene surrounding remittances, incentivize better business practices and, uh, and changes among the remittances industry. And lastly, uh, introduce transformative change among customer behavior, uh, both those on the send and uh, both those that send and uh, and receive uh, remittances. Overall, the, the the findings of this report call upon public authorities, uh, service providers, and civil society organizations to prioritize several measures to build resilience uh, of both market and remittance families. These actions support the effort of public authorities and other stakeholders to also ensure. Uh, service continuity and access to remittances, as I will describe having been a, a, a large issue. Um, this, of course, of most importance for those that rely on, on remittances uh, the most. So this said, however, it is important to say that the, that the proposed set of measures below are, are the outcome of a consultative process among participants of the RCTF, and they do not represent a formal endorsement by any participant organization per se. These are presented for consideration of public authorities and remittance stakeholders, uh, as it was said before, and in order to prioritize immediate relief measures and address market and enabling environment measures that should be considered over a time frame of approximately six to, to, to 12 months. So the RCTF will continue to, to observe emerging practices and lessons learned that can further refine uh, recommended measures for action and inform a roadmap for effective implementation. So we therefore look forward for the next sessions of the dialogue to implementation to nourish these findings and support stakeholders in uh, replicating solutions where these are again needed, uh, needed the most. So for my part, uh, I would like to bring to bear one of the key aspects of these findings and measures related to remittance families. As mentioned previously, remittance service providers uh, are, as of December 2020, still for the most part, not deemed as essential services by national authorities. Uh, sadly, for th this is still a reality uh, within, uh, within um, countries around the world, uh, except in, in some, and we notice this, the, the, this practices, but uh, with the recurrence of a potential crisis and lockdowns, we will be back where we were in, in, uh, in February this year. So for remittance families, 
this really this crisis has, has showcased once more a, a, that a global economy that is literally hidden in plain sight. Uh, this is the reality of remittances. Uh, we are while today we are able to quantify global and national remittances flows that literally allow millions of families around the world to address their own daily needs. Very little is known on all its moving parts. And uh, the, the, the lack of information at the peak of the pandemic on how this crisis was affecting migrants has been very revealing, we, we believe. So uh, on, on, uh, on, on this work stream side, uh, I would like to divide it just on the migrant side, what we've seen and on the family side. So on the migrant side, or, or the sending side of remittances, as it is called, uh, which virtually refer, uh, there was no central centralized database that could provide information as to which migrants were affected or not of, uh, within this crisis. Only anecdotal evidence allowed experts such as many in the RCTF to understand the impact that this crisis was having on the life of migrants and their families back home, which many, as I mentioned before, were unable to, to receive funds. So, of course, many of this was due to unemployment issues. Uh, but for a large majority, it has been the fact that they had no access to an alternative sending mechanism. Uh, for the remittances community, for the migrant sending, once they, there's a system set, uh, that's the system that is used. Uh, and very loyal to it, but this crisis uh, has turned everything upside down. So uh, many that were unemployed were turned to savings to compensate for the lack of income. Uh, others, such as non-regular senders, started to send money more regularly uh, to support their loved ones. And uh, this could be reflected in the, in the flows of remittances that in some cases we saw actually increasing. Uh, and what most important change that we've seen over the first months of the crisis is that many migrated, if we can use that term, to digital services to get money home. Uh, but a lot was done within a trial and error approach that caused, in some cases, security issues for some and many of the RCTF members, particularly from the private sector, brought that issue uh, to bear. So overall, the lack of financial services is what we really uh, see to have been extremely harmful to, to many families. And this, uh, this has to change. The opportunity to boost financial inclusion, as it was mentioned by our colleagues from the G20, uh, so boost financial inclusion among remittance families is enormous. And this is not a question of assets of income, but of, ac but of access and business strategies, uh, weirdly enough. Many senders and recipients are bankable and can build a credit, um, a credit history. If we can put back the, the um, thank you. Uh, so many senders and recipients are bankable and, uh, and uh, as I was mentioning, have, uh, can build a credit, uh, a credit history. And of course, but this requires financial literacy support to remittance families. And, and, and that's sort of, of the essence and should be supported on both sending and receiving sides. And we're very happy to, to have that convey from our colleagues from the, from the G20. Last but not least, particular attention should be given to women again, uh, either on the sending or the receiving side that has oftentimes, and this has been demonstrated in a crisis, uh, women being most vulnerable in, uh, in this process. Examples for all this already exist. This is the, this is the good news. Uh, this should be replicated and scale if we are to avoid another crisis situation such as, uh, such as the current one. This should be looked upon by stakeholders in both sides and not only in the public authority related to finance and payments issue, but the industry as well, agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture and others as well that would normally not, will not look into the issue of remittances as something that they will naturally need to focus on. And this is something that definitely has to change. Private sector has to be part of this dialogue and understand the business case opportunity. Uh, and, I, and I would like to underline the word opportunity. There is indeed a good business case in banking remittances recipients and senders. It's been done for over 40 years and number of exa examples exist. Uh, many countries in Europe have benefited from remittances and integrating those that send and receive remittances in their, in their, uh, in their financial system. And it, it's there. Uh, and again, it's four years old experience. Unfortunately, many of those, uh, uh, of those examples have been lost to history and they, we should recover them. So in short, these aspects will be the base for the subsequent discussions uh, in the upcoming sessions. And I really look forward to our engagement in bringing these opportunities to bear. 
I invite you to, again, uh, read the document. The opportunity that we have today is to give you the essence of uh, what this report is about. Uh, and, but we, again, we will dig much deeper as the sessions evolve and, and nurture this with, with examples that can allow, once again, implementing these measures uh, and, 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 um, and basically successfully address the mission that the Secretary General has, uh, has put in front of us. So with this, I will now give the floor to our colleague, uh, Leon Isaac, uh, for his introductory, uh, for his introduction to the private sector aspects of the identified measures. And, uh, and then this will be followed by uh, Barry and, uh, and Adish, and, uh, and then to, to discuss certain aspects. So without further ado, Leon, you have the floor. Right, thanks very much indeed, Pedro. Uh, good afternoon to all of you from here, and good morning, good evening, wherever else you might be. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, and talking to you about uh, the private sector stream from the from the blueprint and uh, my colleague Barry uh, in South Africa is going to cover all the exciting stuff around digital I'm going to cover some of the other things so um, I will not um, I will try not to rush but not take too long either I, I think the first thing to say is really and as you alluded to there Pedro um, clearly COVID has impacted every person in the world uh, included in that are remittance businesses, whether they are traditional cash-based money transfer services, the newer digital online services, post offices, banks, or so on. Um, and they've really impacted in three key ways. One is the, the operations, so ranging from are they able to carry on operating during the crisis to changing the way that they operate. Um, so big impacts there. If we look at the volumes, uh, the impact of the crisis on the volumes and pricing, that's been the subject of many, many webinars over the last few months as well. So I won't say very much except to say some companies have been significantly uh, affected from a negative angle and some have had the opposite experience. I think it's obvious that the cash only providers, particularly in Europe, in the early stages where there were significant lockdowns suffered particularly and we heard of cases of up to 80 percent of existing business being lost overnight some of which came back when the lockdowns were increased but not all um, on the other hand we've heard of many of the digital ready businesses that have done very well out of the crisis as people have moved their transactions into those areas and I think that leads to the third major area of impact, which is really just this changing customer behavior that I think all the panelists and speakers in the previous session have talked about. And I'm not going to talk about digital now, but I think I would make the point that uh, even with the shift to digital that everybody is talking about, it's still estimated that around 70% of the volumes are currently going in cash. So whilst we really need to look at digital, how we enhance that for all the, the, the excellent reasons of efficiency, lower cost, greater transparency and so on, I think we have to look at in this implementation phase that we're going into, how do we accelerate that? But also how do we make sure that the services that are used by the people who need to use cash because they have no other alternative, are made as effective and efficient um, as possible. So um, I think what I'd like to do now is um, just briefly talk about some of the key areas that are in the blueprint um, piece that um, are, have a direct impact on the private sector in particular. And before doing that, I think I'd just say that it's absolutely vital to build on your point, Pedro, that all the stakeholders enter the most open uh, dialogue they possibly can. I think it's actually been one of the encouraging features so of the um, crisis so far is the way there has been good dialogue, the way that national task forces have been set up and stakeholders have come together and shared experience. And I really hope that hope, as things level out, hopefully, that that dialogue continues and that we also tackle some of the longer longer term issues. So I'd really encourage um, as many participants as possible to come to the following streams that we're going to have next year 
um, and also do what they can in your individual countries uh, and regions. I think if we look at the recommendations that have come out or the action areas of uh, the blueprint that don't involve digital payments, for me, excuse me, for me, um, I, I think there's the short and immediate term activities, which hopefully by now everybody has taken care of and, and implemented. Um, but there are some things that may have been introduced as a temporary measure, perhaps changes to transaction and balance limits for uh, mobile payments that perhaps need to be looked at as to whether they should continue or not and evaluations made because they could be good long-term improvements. I think things like waiving taxes on remittances need to be looked at um, whether they can be continued. Um, and in the longer term, I think the areas I'd really focus on, one is data. Um, there's been a lot of an analytical work at, undertaken during the last six to nine months, um, but there's still a distinct lack of data. And if we had more data, we'd be able to make even better informed decisions for the benefit of all. Um, the next one is transparency. For some reason, remittances, which are not generally the most complex product out there, so it seems to be very hard to get true transparency so that consumers know exactly what they're going to receive, how long it's going to take um, before they make the transaction. And I think this is an area we could easily get right. Um, the next one is even if we've got new products and applications, we need financial literacy. This needs to be really there. We need to work out ways of getting that to exactly where it's needed. And then there's some practical things about making sure we make it as easy as possible for businesses that are qualified to operate, to enter markets not discriminate. So I know that Harish will cover regulations, so I won't go on about that anymore. And then I think we have a faithful friend, um, de-risking. There are some initiatives that are taking place, we're aware of that are being tried to bring more trust between operators, um, regulators, um, and other participants in the market, but we need to take that even further. So I'll stop there. Um, Barry, I hope I haven't said everything you were going to say um, and hand over to, uh, to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Yeah. Barry, you have the floor. Thank you, Pedro. Um, uh, good evening, good, good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll just look, off, look, look at the uh, digitalization um, aspects. Uh, so in the financial services sector, we have seen that um, Fundamental change is often not associated, is associated with a critical event. So things really don't change until there's something critical. And we, we saw that with mobile money uh, entering into the market. So the world has digitized in a very, very short time. And um, it shows little, little sign of returning to analog face-to-face -face environments. Um, so this blueprint for action um, in the private sector is an opportunity for remittance com the community to uh, fully implement uh, key processes and business model changes. Many of these were, were, were already on the cards or, or were, were developed, but in, these incremental changes or acceleration of existing programs can enable remittances and e-money sectors to, uh, to be um, at the forefront of economic recovery in the developing markets uh, through more cost-effective and inclusive digital de uh, delivery channels, and particularly at greater scale. Um, and at scale is the most important thing because we see that informality in the sector is significant, um, but has had a setback during the So informal remittances will in time bounce back stronger and probably digitally and, and become a formidable competitor again in many markets. Um, but it's only through the coordin co coordinated public-private partnership efforts um, that formal services can match or exceed the drivers of informality without compromising standards. So there is a big market out there that is in, that has been run informally that that um, uh, formal players can, can leverage and scale, uh, particularly digitally. As I'll go through some of the few examples. Um, uh, the, the, the recommendations are very rich um, on digitalization. So I'm just highlighting the, the, um, the, some, some of the ones that, 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 that stick out, um, particularly where there's increased focus on digitalization um, uh, aligned with regulatory frameworks can lead to more sustainable or cost-effective sector. Um, so digitalization of remittances is uh, key to the sustainability 
quality of remittance flows during COVID period, but also during the economic recovery period. Um, to, uh, and to a large extent depends on the private sector's ability to embrace and sustain digitalized remittance channels. A uh, pivotal enabler of the responsible digitalization is the ability to create or assert a digital identity um, and the infrastructure and risk management uh, associated with it within organizations and also, also within sectors. So enabling risk proportionate uh, customer due diligence through digital identity proofing and AML CFT frameworks is vital uh, for greater participation whilst not compromising standards. So we look at the, the blueprint print measures in this regard are, um, you can look up uh, 16, seven and three, they are foundational in that they um, enable safer and wider access to well fit for purpose uh, product functionality. And, and recommendation 16 is uh, to facilitate the uh, customer due diligence processes and measures. And this is particularly looking at alternative and appropriate forms of identification proofing um, that are critical to include. So, uh, uh, it's critical for, for groups such as migrant workers, those with limited identifiers, um, uh, rural workers receiving families, also women who have less access to formal credentials and documents. So key digital uh, credentials, identifiers and proxy identifiers need to be robust or able to become more robust over time uh, but should always be aligned with, with risk and existing uh, uh, consumer due diligence uh, uh, measures. Some examples, um, particularly for the markets we're looking at is SIM card registration documents and the interoperability of those, uh, biometrics such as image and voice, voice in particular where, where feature phones or their low data networks. Uh, consider the fact of guidance on CDD along with delayed um, uh, verification where allowed, um, this, uh, which can be critical. So the, the key value of these measures is that they enable a fluid flow of excluded or low risk consumers into the formal system without negatively impacting the overall risk. It also enables competition with informal services that rely on the lack of documentation, as well as the inconvenience and logistics barriers of rural people to engage in face-to-face -face CDD with physical documents. So that, that's, a, that's a foundational piece in, in order to enable uh, many of the others. The other one, the other recommendation that I see is, is quite, is quite uh, uh, pivotal is recommendation seven. It's uh, promote regional and national uh, public-private working groups to improve awareness and preparedness. This is vital in, in that um, private, for, for the private sector to uh, collaborate on a mutually beneficial but not competitive basis and to clearly define the boundaries of cooperation and competition is important. Um, Private sector don't 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 cooperate to you know naturally. Um, so robust and high quality feedback to regulators and supervisors is also key in addressing laws, regulations, related frameworks to enable more sustainable sector at scale, particularly um, with the post uh, COVID nineteen recovery in mind. Uh, private uh, public private partnerships would be more effective as a sector in making inroads into the key drivers of informality, namely access, trust cost, digitalization, and timely transactions. So another, another aspect is um, uh, recommendation three, consider temporary revisions of transaction and balance limits. So the, with, in, in the position where we are now, we should consider you know, what, what limits should, you know, what uh, those limits should be going forward and how best to manage those, the, the, those limits and transactional ban balances um, aligned with risk and aligned with growth in the, in, in the sector. That, that's key to, to enable people to get transacting and to stay transacting. So uh, one of the foundational aspects are in place, uh, transactional measures become more important considerations. So measures 11, 12, and 15, then, then come to the fore. 11 and 12 is both, are both utilizing the digital identity and digital identity proofing um, to, to sustain other, other types of payments. So it's provide uh, financial support to remittance receiving families and to leverage service providers payment networks uh, for um, expertise and urgent services, um, uh, including humanitarian assist assistance. So once, you, once you've got a robust uh, identity and you, you enable people on the platform, it's, it's leveraging that platform for other, for other things. Um, another one is uh, 15, which is encourage digital channels for sending and receiving remittances. So private 
sectors should gear up towards international payment instrument standards and quality assurance, um, uh, ensure their internal operations, processes, and risk managers with a view to linking up to the national payment system. Participation directly or through an intermediary bank should be weighed up in terms of any additional administrative and prudential burdens, but RSPs and e-money providers should actively participate in industry sandboxes or similar test and learn regulation for innovation processes. I'll, I'll, I'll cut it off there, but digitization in, 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 in our view um, is, is a double-edged sword. As, as Leon said, we must be cognizant of providing the catch cash bridge or cashing out agents um, uh, facilities whilst we're in digitalization. And it, it's often not possible to digitalize because of a number of factors. But, but when you look at, at the overlying areas or over, overlapping areas of those factors, it's often possible to, to digitalize in pockets and thereby gain scale and, and digitalize um, uh, greater areas. But thanks a lot. I, I'll, I'll return back to Pedro. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for, for, for this. Actually, in the chat, there's already some, some questions on, on this and uh, that I will call upon you uh, to, to, to support in answering, particularly on how this has impacted from your view on the informal flows or the flows that were sent in an informal or through informal channels. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of information still missing, but uh, on trends in that regard. So we will get back to that, uh, to that question. Uh, but now it is my uh, my my pleasure to to uh, to call for Arish to uh, Natarajan again, a lead financial sector specialist, uh, finance competitiveness and innovation of the World Bank Group. Uh, uh, they've been the co-lead of this entire process, particularly with uh, with the enabling environment piece, and of course uh, in, that influenced the, the, the creation of this blueprint within a, pro, within a structure, uh, that call for the general principles, which the World Bank, uh, and the Bank of International Settlements, uh, had, uh, had released now some time ago, almost a decade ago. So, uh, Arish, uh, I will, uh, I will give you the floor for your, I believe you do have a presentation and we can change it for you if you, if you wish. You just say when you want to, to, to show it, but you have the floor. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Pedro. And uh, in the interest of time, maybe I can, uh, I can skip the presentation and also in line of um, what Leon and Barry um, uh, had, had structured their interventions. So I can, I'm happy to- Then I'll ask the secretary uh, to, I will kindly ask the secretary then, then to unshare the screen. There you go. But uh, if maybe we will be sure. able to share some information later uh, in the, right. in the okay. uh, so kind of uh, my, my job is of course quite easy now with, uh, with Leon and Barry laying out what is required. And um, so I think my job is simply to say that, well, all of that uh, needs to be then uh, reflected in the policy regulatory uh, framework in any given country. Uh, but let me, uh, let me uh, take a step back and, and really look at um, kind of uh, what what is what, what's what's uh, what's happening with respect to the uh, dynamics of the legal and uh, uh, policy framework uh, aspects related to the remittances? So now, very uh, very clearly, this um, this whole um, pandemic which we're living through clearly exposed um, certain fundamental uh, gaps in the in the way the remittances are structured. Mm -hmm. Of course, heavy dependence on cash um, made certain uh, for certain segments of the society and in certain corridors. Uh, remittance services were impacted uh, for, for some time, but of course it, uh, the industry responded very quickly um, and they were restored um, fairly um, in, in good order. But, but clearly it showed um, uh, some, some implications. Um, and, um, and then also, there was also a rapid um, adoption of digital, not specifically for remittances, but, but in many of the sending and receiving countries, we saw a rapid adoption of digital for uh, for day-to-day -day, um, commerce and daily living, and then also for government benefit transfer and so on. So this also created a momentum in terms of um, both on the sending country side and the receiving country side, uh, the awareness of digital, the support for digital from the governments. I think all of that um, was also something which, uh, which, is, which, is, which is something which can be harnessed for the remittances as well. Uh, and then the third area was uh, uh, incidentally, the fact of release their guidelines for digital ID uh, sometime um, in late, um, early, early 2020. Uh, and that also in some sense coincided 
with this broader shift towards digital, where uh, they in fact recognized as part of their uh, the guidelines uh, that digital ID uh, based uh, customer due diligence uh, and uh, EKYC, so to say, in some cases might might be uh, even even more reliable than face to face interactions in certain certain contexts. And that essentially then paves the way for uh, also rapid adoption of well-designed digital ID mechanisms for, for remittances as well. So I think that's the context in which um, uh, we, uh, when we looked at the, uh, uh, this whole topic in the, in the community task force, uh, our attempt was to see how these can all be, all be uh, leveraged. No? Um, and we went back to the, the global um, uh, uh, kind of the general principles, which was set up in 2007, 2008, by the World Bank and the uh, Committee for Payment Market Infrastructures of the BIS, and we found that those still remain relevant. Uh, and we, uh, of course, um, uh, then looked at specific issues which might need to be flagged, uh, which are very pertinent in this in this given context. So the first one is um, uh, related to uh, clear information on the total cost of sending and receiving remittances. And here, um, as as Leon mentioned. It, it's a little paradoxical because remittance is a fairly simple product. There are essentially two or three elements to be uh, to be looked at. One is the what is the fees to be paid by the sender, uh, and in case there's a fees to be paid by the recipient, and what is that? When will the recipient receive it? Where can the recipient go and collect it? Uh, or, or, or or which account or kind of which kind of accounts it will be uh, remitted into? And then what are the foreign exchange fees, which is uh, implicit in the in the transfer, right? What's the amount the recipient will, will receive? Um, and we we notice as part of our monitoring of the uh, remittance prices as part of the remittance prices worldwide database that for many of the new digital uh, remittance services we are seeing um, under our uh, under our uh, 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 methodology, we classify many of them as not being fully transparent uh, because some of these elements are not fully specified. Uh, and it's not very clear. And some of it could be is just simply related to the way the information is conveyed. Some of it just could be uh, because the information is simply not provided. And some of it could be because uh, many of the digital remittances channels actually have multiple parties involved in, in, the, in the context of the transaction. And so maybe not all the fees are, are immediately apparent. So that's why we thought it would be important to emphasize this point on clear information on total cost of sending and receiving remittances. And uh, we are able to, of course, track it through our remittance supervisors worldwide database. And we hope that uh, that will also motivate uh, more providers to um, uh, to ensure that their services are uh, are, are fully transparent. The, um, the other issue, uh, which was also quite apparent, is that uh, when uh, some of the cash-based channels were impacted uh, because of the um, uh, government shutdown, um, government, government required shutdowns, um, and then also in some cases simply because there were uh, issues related to the liquidity at the agent location, um, the, there was an attempt to shift towards digital. And uh, there was a case, there were several cases where um, recipients and, uh, and senders were not able to fully make that transition to digital. And uh, one reason, of course, um, uh, it was because of lack of awareness, lack of um, familiarity with the processes. And uh, there were a couple of cases where governments actually came out with public announcements, uh, public um, advertisement campaigns, uh, joined with the industry to clearly describe how the process would work. But of course, this is assuming that they, they have access to accounts and on both sides. Um, uh, but uh, even if you have that, uh, we, we noticed that there were certain challenges with certain customer segments faced, and uh, that's why we thought it would be important to to bring this out. And, and also, very specifically, there's a gender dimension to this, um, and that's why we specifically emphasize also the gender angle. The, um, the other uh, point was related to, um, in, uh, in, uh, on, the, on the remittance side, of course, sending aside the financial inclusion challenges um, are there for certain corridors, but in certain other corridors, in particular the ones uh, kind of corresponding to the US, Europe, and so on, on the sending side, uh, the level of financial inclusion for the migrant workers is typically higher. But on the receiving side, uh, it might not be the case. And, uh, and even in countries where mobile money has penetrated, uh, and there's a fair amount of um, uh, inclusion with respect to access to transaction accounts, uh, as many of these re regulations um, do not, um, regulatory frameworks in many countries, do not allow recipient recipient of international remittances onto mobile money accounts. And this is, of course, based on the risk considerations and when the mobile money was initially launched, it was intended to be domestic person-to-person uh, -person transfers. 
uh, and then also for domestic payments. Uh, but as um, the, uh, the range of services being offered on mobile money is, is becoming larger, uh, and then also the uh, penetration that is higher, it is important now to really see how can we connect the mobile money ecosystem to the international remittances networks. There are a number of business models which have come out on this uh, through white labeling, through partnership of um, these mobile money companies with established players like Western Union and so on. And there are many different models which are being seen and there are also hubs which are being seen. So this is creating a challenge for regulatory frameworks to see how they can adjust to this. And then also to specifically allow receipt of international remittances on, on, onto mobile money accounts. And there are some few countries which actually at the height of all this pandemic actually allow uh, receipt of international remittances onto, onto mobile money. And we are able to see a, a drop in the average cost uh, in, in those countries. So I think um, there's a need to really look at the regulatory framework to see that it allows these new business models which are emerging, and then also to allow the credit of remittances into, uh, into the mobile money accounts. Um, so there are also the case of um, um, restrictions related to new players entering, entering the market um, uh, with new business models as I was mentioning, uh, and this is again is an area which, which needs attention. Um, the, um, the other um, set of intervention which we saw was temporary increase in the limits of wallet uh, balances which can be kept in the mobile money accounts, uh, balances for agents disbursing um, uh, their kind of doing the cash and cash out business. So I think uh, all of those uh, increases in the limit also facilitated general adoption of digital payments in the countries. And, uh, and this is also something which might be relevant for remittances because entire remittances might be typically larger than the domestic person-to-person -person transfers. And this is also an area uh, which, which needs to be uh, uh, certainly looked at. And related to this point is also the, the customer due diligence process related to uh, subscribing for an online uh, digital remittance services, and then also opening an account in, in the receiving country side for receiving remittances digitally. And this, this, uh, the relaxation related to the requirements related to that, taking advantages of the new digital ID Based capabilities which are coming in is also something uh, which will be very, very uh, important to look at. And a few countries uh, did uh, make changes related to this. Some of it was actually in relation to uh, the social benefit transfers, uh, and uh, that provides a template which can be used for also expanding uh, to remittances, of course, taking into account the specific um, risk characteristics of uh, international remittances, but there, there are uh, opportunities to, to really look at that. And then lastly, um, uh, the, the topic of de-risking, of course, um, remains uh, and, and uh, uh, an issue which we need to keep, uh, keep um, our focus on. And, and here again, as more remittances move towards digital channels, I think um, there is an opportunity to, um, uh, to uh, re re kind of relook at this whole dynamics on de-risking because once the remittances are originated in an account, terminated in an account, and those accounts are held by regulatory service providers or subject to AMO safety regulations in the countries, then I think the discussion point with the correspondent banks becomes very different. Uh, and the dynamics become very different. Um, so I think this again um, is an opportunity uh, which, we can, uh, which we can look at. Um, so with this, let me, uh, let me conclude by, by noting that uh, there are a few issues we have identified. Implementation of these is of course very, very key. Um, and, um, uh, and this requires the collaboration between both the public and private sector and the World Bank and other uh, multilateral institutions, of course, stand available to support countries uh, in, um, in implementing some of these reforms, sharing uh, uh, information and also contributing to the monitoring of some of these trends. So with this, let me, uh, let me uh, thank you for, um, um, uh, for, um, for your kind of attention and I'll pass it back to Pedro. Pedro, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Arish, for uh, for uh, for summing up uh, what will be a lot of the subsequent discussions in the in the sessions. I, uh, thank you. You did a very good job in in in, in tying many of these uh, issues uh, issues together. Uh, we don't have much time, uh, so I would like us to to be able to address some of the uh, some of the questions that have been uh, that have been sent from uh, from from, uh, from the audience. Uh, so I'll just put them out, and, and if in turn you you could all uh, um, take a shot at at, at them. Uh, one was on the consequences of this crisis in regards to 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 informal flows, as uh, as we mentioned, and uh, and if you could give your perspective from the private sector, uh, Leon as well as uh, as Barry, and uh, and 
the for Irish uh, on, on the, in this regard is uh, from the perspective of central banks uh, and the new elements that you said. I think you already answered that question in a way, as uh, as through the through the uptake of mobile uh, mobile money that will definitely change the degree of, of discussion. So it would be great to address this. There's a question on the ICT infrastructure, uh, well put, I think, uh, that represents a major issue for many African countries, for instance, as it is mentioned, for uh, for uptake of digital, of digital remittances services. So Barry, if you could maybe expand on, uh, on, uh, on that. And uh, the first question that I can already address was the fact that Indeed, uh, the creating opportunities back home will, will mitigate all this issue of our remittances. And I'm very glad to say that, indeed, this is the whole reason why remittances are addressed by the development community. Uh, the remittances uh, per se don't have a problem. It's family supporting their, their loved ones back, back home, but they're a fantastic missed opportunity to do more. And, uh, and today, the majority of migrants sending money home are migrant workers. And for most of them, migration uh, is not a choice, but a necessity. And if we can work, if we can have remittances work actually against what generated them at the, uh, at the very early stage, the lack of economic opportunities, we can actually turn this around and create more opportunities that will make uh, migrant workers just my, uh, looking at migration as more of an option rather than necessity. For that, economic opportunities need to be created. Remittances can do that, hence the linkage with financial inclusion. And the whole discussion about resilience uh, that has been so, uh, so crucial in this discussion over the, of the crisis. The resilience that we can prepare today will be the insurance for, for future crises. So, uh, I will let an, uh, a tour uh, uh, among our, our speakers. So Leon, Barry, and, and Irish, uh, maybe some comments on, on this, on the informality, infrastructure on, on digital, and, um, and as well on implementation, Irish. Uh, there's another question on, on this, how to stimulate governments uh, in, in, into digging into this implementation. Leon? Okay, thanks, uh, Pedro, and thanks very much uh, for the question on informality. So just briefly, I mean, I think, um, as ever, it's very difficult to get hard facts and data on informal, but there is a generally perceived um, reality out there that informal has been as badly, if not worsely, I'm sorry, that's not my good English, has been badly affected by the crisis. Um, compared to formal operations, particularly as a result of the travel bans that have gone on. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, it's been very difficult for migrants to travel home. Um, and there are many communities, you know, Europe to Morocco being a good example, where people would normally go once a year and take a lot of money in cash with them that they would then distribute when they, when they got there. So that's a form of informal. There are, of course, more formalized informal channels, um, but often they've also involved the physical transportation of settlement monies to certain countries where they've got accounts. This is where de-risking actually has come in and stopped formal businesses from always being able to, um, to handle um, their uh, settlements in a normal way. But it's become much harder for um, the informal operators just because of the lack of mobility that's out there. And then I think um, finally, on top of that, we're also seeing that in order to be able to use some of the digital businesses out there, or pretty much all of them, you need to be able to have more formalized identification or use people who have that to send on your behalf. And there does seem to be an element of that. So as things ease off, will we see a return to informal methods? Undoubtedly, I'm sure we will in many cases, but it probably won't be to the same level as we have. So it may be another silver lining. And if you look at the increase in transactions volumes to some countries that have defied expectations, I think particularly some of the Asian economies, a lot of that is being put down to um, the informal transactions now being sent through more formalized means. So uh, I'll stop there, hand over to uh, Ari, I guess. 
Yeah, so, so uh, did, did right, uh, Leon, but also um, a lot of the informal remittances are on the back of illicit flows, and that can be um, uh, resources and, and, other, and other commodities that, that move around instead of settlement. And uh, with, with a lot of the, the, the trade snagging up in ports and that, they, they can't settle. And so they, they literally run out, of, run out of cash or they run out of, of settlement in one side or the other. But, but from, from our point of view, with the DRC, the, the, this, it's mostly informal. Um, but you know, for, from, from the, the, the offices that, that we know that, that do informal uh, remittances from our mystery shopping, it's that they're closed, that, that they're, they're not operational. So, so, so clearly there's, there's an issue. Uh, they are, they're either very conformist in terms of COVID regulations or they, or, or, or they, or they are actually closed. So there was there was a question with regard to um, uh, digital infrastructure. Now that, that yes. that's an important one. So we, we we've been we've been looking at um, uh, particularly the, the three or three of the Pacific Islands at the moment, um, and the, the digital infrastructure doesn't naturally occur. But you do find a, a lot of identifiers within within different ministries and within different uh, private sector institutions that can that can be utilised. It's about it's about putting in a comprehensive um, uh, a program. That can maintain privacy, but also can can uh, can share credentials, and can uh, can you can have a, a more robust approach. We've been looking at particularly proxy identifiers, where whereby you can stack a number of of, of uh, highly robust proxy identifiers, which for us is uh, you know it, it gives you a, a, a very very slim a, a slim uh, probability of of, of bad actors um, coming in. They they they're becoming a lot more robust. And yes, not all digital is the same. Some digital is really flawed. So you'd have to have some, some kind of quality assurance behind it. But um, the indications are that, that it's a lot more robust and it's a lot more accessible to people because they can start accessing it from just as much as, as a SIM card registration or even just a, a, voice, a, a voice template on, 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 a, on a, um, a feature phone. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, on, on this. Uh, Arish? Here. Yes, um, so I think um, the Leon and Barry... Particular implementation also... <laughs> of the public sector. Yes, oh, sorry, um, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, so, so Leon and, um, and Barry covered most of the points, but just, just one, one remark on the, on the informal sector. So if the, um, uh, some, of the, some of the commentators have been noting that some of the increase in volumes is because of um, because of some shift from informal to formal, that basically shows that the informal always had a mechanism to send, but they chose not to send, right? So, um, so I think it's not a so the barriers actually might not be more. It's just more about wanting to do it that way. So hopefully, uh, as part of the um, uh, experience of switching to uh, switching to the regulator channels, uh, hopefully um, the uh, they they find it more convenient and and this will hopefully sustain, right? But there, there are other factors why they were choosing uh, to, to send it to um, informal channels, then uh, hopefully, then, uh, it, then one has to really see uh, what happens after things normalize, right? Whether uh, the incentives will change and, and so on. But this clearly provides an opportunity for the government to, to uh, assess the full scale of uh, remittance flows, which, uh, which can come, come into the country, and hopefully some data analysis could help in, in identifying some more measures which can be looked at. From implementation perspective, I think um, this topic of remittances cannot be looked at in isolation. I think one has to look at uh, a broader um, set of issues which are which are happening uh, from financial inclusion perspective, from the desire of governments to be able to reach um, individuals and small businesses rapidly in terms of social uh, protection programs, uh, and then also the broader digital economy uh, discussion which is happening in many countries. So I think um, it is important for us to plug into some of the discussions which are happening. Um, and, and, and combine uh, the efforts related to implementation of the measures we are talking about as part of that, right? So, so if you're talking about, um, say, for example, the social protection programs where uh, governments are moving in a big way to bring in a lot of uh, individuals onto the, uh, onto the social protection system, uh, they are having to grapple with this whole issue of identification. How do you, how do you uh, get them to open accounts? And once you uh, open that, then uh, ensuring that those same things can also be used for these remittances is, I think, the way we should proceed. So instead of just looking at, at this topic from remittances, I think we need to cast the net a little wider and collaborate with more, uh, uh, more, more, um, uh, more stakeholders uh, in the, the, both in the domestic uh, context as well as uh, in, in the semi-country side. Thank you. 
So could, 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 I, could I just chip in? Yes, uh, yes, please uh, go ahead. Absolutely uh, agree, Harish, on, on that. Um, because just from our recent study, we, what we've seen is that the the, um, the the CDE or customer due diligence for remittance providers alone uh, just outweighs the banks and everything because of the number of times that that that, that, that they do it. And so in a an environment where you can reutilize credentials in, in a safe and, and robust way is, is very, very effective. Um, it cut down the cost of, cost of compliance. I mean, 60% of, of the cost of compliance is face-to-face is -face, um, remits. That's from our cost of compliance study, is face-to-face is -face, uh, onboarding or, or, or uh, uh, assessing of credentials. Thank you. Thank you very for, for that. These are extremely relevant points, and uh, and actually, you're mentioning a, a broader set of issues, and I believe this is what uh, your our colleague from Muntad was was mentioning, and why this process actually is so relevant. Uh, it, it encompasses so many other uh, so many other topics and and uh, and areas, and hence why again, uh, bringing this with the G20, with, uh, with the financing for development and creating the right linkages and, uh, and, and ramifications is so, so essential. At the same time, from the amount of questions that we have, uh, it's begging to, to get more deeper into each of the issues. So I'm very happy to, to say this has been just a launching event uh, to, to, to give a hint uh, of the issues at stake and uh, uh, it's a live process. So a lot of these questions will be answered online I'm not going to say that we're going to be doing this 24/7, but uh, maybe from eight to five, uh, five days a week, we're going to be putting the information out up till the, our next uh, our next sessions. Uh, as we know that there's three tracks now that have been created on remittance families on private sector enabling environment. Each of these tracks will have subsequent sessions that we expect to run every month, leading towards the next summit. So we can all come. To the next summit, well prepared and with, in, with issues already engaged, address and examples at, at hand. So I invite you to, to to look at the at the upcoming events that we're going to be hosting in uh, in January. Uh, the, the the dialogue to implementation of regions families from crisis response to recovery. We're going to dig more in the examples. Some of the questions that were asked in the chat were, what are the measures that really that governments on the sending side can actually do? Uh, I think the blueprint answers to a lot of that on the priorities that have been identified, but much more can, can be done and, and, uh, and this dialogue maybe can, can bear more, more, more detail on that. On, on private sector, um, we are going to look in, uh, on January 12, a response through innovation and adaptation, a, a session that will be done in collaboration with our colleagues from, uh, from DMA. Uh, which will be followed with one with GSMA, where ser serving the last mile digitalization reality in rural African markets, we'll, we will come with a wealth of examples as well on how can be the uh, this uh, one, how can this be done and inspire also local markets and governments. Uh, the, on track three, the role of the public sector. The next session will be done in collaboration with our with our colleague uh, uh, the co-leads from the enabling environment. Um, and, and, and dig more into the, what Arish was, uh, was uh, suggesting, but also ask in the, in, the in the chat and enter more in depth into all the principles that we, have, uh, um, that we have addressed. And subsequently, specific issues like Barry, uh, you introduced on customer due diligence and transparency. How do we implement this in Africa? What are the challenges? Uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, all the partners here Leon, uh, Barry, and Arish, uh, and Ifad, we're all at this very moment implementing actions. And I think we will leave this for, for the sessions, uh, but, uh, but I think we need to be more, there should be more of us uh, doing exactly that. So uh, we are already six minutes over, over the time, uh, but uh, we will answer some of the pending questions online. We wanted to thank everybody for this successful launch, but more importantly, I want to speak on behalf of 40 institutions, all duly mentioned in the remittances community task force blueprint for action. This is not an IFAD report. This is not a, a co-lead report. This is a, a report delivered by one by four stick, uh, 40 stakeholders uh, that has been truly engaged in this process. We're very proud uh, of, of this. And uh, once more, it's a process that will continue uh, in the months to come as, as, it, as it evolves. So uh, I also invited back our, 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 uh, our 
colleagues from the first sessions to thank. Unfortunately, Magda and Mike had to leave there, I announced. Um, but you're, you, I saw yes, your uh, hand rising, so please, if you want to have the final word, also, I prefer that. Um, just, just a few remarks about the importance of your work. I think we should all uh, daily be reminded that uh, external development finance is in peril. Uh, we need the recovery of remittances as one of the key sources for developing countries to deal with the economic impact of the pandemic. And we cannot be too outspoken about the problems that the COVID-19 virus has created throughout the world. And we cannot be uh, too mindful of the fact that this is mostly hurtful in the developing countries and that uh, the uh, SDG goal number one of eradic eradicating extreme poverty is now almost without uh, any possibility to be reached by 2030 if we don't get our act together. Remittances have to play a key role in that and that's why your work is so important and that's why I congratulate you and wish you to continue on this on this path. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much and I think the, the task force takes it uh, well and uh, you we will all create and we invite also more partners to join the, the, the task force and to help host this, uh, this dialogue as, uh, as we go forward. So unless there is, uh, there is any last comments uh, or, or address from our colleagues, uh, I, would, uh, I would excuse uh, everyone and thanking them again so much for, for being part of this launching event, uh, but we will see you soon enough, uh, I hope in, uh, well, next year only uh in uh, well more, less than a month so thank you so much for for being part of this event and uh, have a good evening for uh, and a good continuation of the day for 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 some of you thank you so much